for thank you all for being here today. Um, so I'm really excited uh, because I get to introduce not only two wonderful speakers and people, but um, two wonderful friends as well. And uh, we're going to start with David, and then I'll introduce Seal, and then Seal will go first, and then David. Um, so David Escobar currently works as a fourth district aide to the Marine County Board of Supervisors, Steve Kinsey. He was a former probation officer for the adult division of the Marine County Probation Department and drug and alcohol counselor for the Marine County Jail for Bay Area Community Resources. David is a current member of the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association, American Indigenous Research Association, and an advisory board member for the Marine Museum of the American Indian. Since 2011, David participates at the United Nations Indigenous Permanent Forum in New York City, where he is an official credential, creden, credentialed representative of the Binational Indigenous so Salvadorian Council. David also holds a bachelor's degree in humanities from New York College, a master's degree in organizational leadership from St. Mary's College, and current part-time adjunct faculty at Dominican University of California uh, in schools of the arts, humanities, and social services, where he teaches indigenous perspectives. I have worked with David for many years in particular uh, with a project called Summer of Opportunities, where David helps to promote fun and educational activities to children while keeping them safe off the streets during the summer. Proud parent of two children, one of whom is registered member of the Lakota Nation at the Cheyenne River Reservation in South Dakota. Um, we are very lucky as citizens here in Marin County to have him, um, to, to know him and to have him be here and, uh, and to represent all, not just us, but all, all sorts of people. So uh, we are very blessed to have him and so I'm thankful for you to be here. And so, and seriously, I had to, when I looked up their bios, I had to cut down because uh, these, these people are amazing. Um, Cio Hernandez is a licensed marriage family therapist and with over 20 years of experience. In her role as mental health practic practitioner for the Marin County Department of Health and Human Services, Community Health and Prevention Services, CO is accustomed to working with all forms of people, all walks of life. Marin County is the wealthiest county in Marin, in California, yet there are great uh, disparities between <coughs> its communities. So working for the health equity across many different communities, CO serves as a liaison with the Marin County Board of Supervisors. She sits on the Institutional Review Board for the Kaiser Foundation, and um, she, uh, with the Kaiser Foundation Research Institute, acts as chair of the community committee for the Bay Area Health Inequities Initiative, and serves on the first five Marine Children and Families Commission. Sia has significantly experienced, uh, she has significant experience in international projects as well. She has acted as consultant with the Russian foreign ministries, law enforcement, and public health delegates. She has trained doctors and nurses and teachers in El Salvador. Uh, she has pioneered and chaired the Binational Health Week Initiative, conducted strategic planning, and worked closely with, dig with dignitaries from the United States, Canada, Mexico, and nine other Latin American countries. CEO also maintains a private practice specializing in eye movement desensitization uh, reprocessing, a well-researched, efficient, and effective technique that helps ch uh, clients resolve distressing mem memories in a concrete way. CEO uses what is called EMDR to help her clients search their personal, uh, to reach their personal and professional goals. CEO's work also includes significant media experiences with the radio, with the TV. Um, she's been with Univision, uh, um, with uh, CSB, um, 
CVS San Francisco, KPIX. Uh, she has uh, worked with National Public Radio, KPFA, and uh, many other radio stations. In other words, she has had like six jobs in the, she, she holds like six, seven jobs in the past <laughs> 10 years, seriously. I mean, everybody knows her. You, you say, where's Sio? <laughs> Who doesn't know Sio? So, um, Sio has been honored with many awards, uh, including the Marine Human Rights Commission's Martin Luther King's Jr.'s Humanitarian Awards, the KQED Latino Heritage Month Bay Area Unsung Local Hero Award, and the San Francisco Foundation's Coachland Kosh Civic Unity Award. She has also been presented with uh, certificates of honor and achievement, appreciation, and recognition by elected officials such as Assemblymember Mark Levine, Mar Marine County Supervisors Judy Arnold, uh, Steve Kinsey, David Connolly, David Connolly, and Congressman Jared Huffman, and the, um, our State Senator Mike Mawire. CEO has um, done her homework, of course. Uh, she's got two bachelor's degree from UC Berkeley. A woman's study is one of them. Counseling psychology is another one. She has her master's of, uh, of science in counseling psychology from Dominican University of California. And she has her PhD in healthcare leadership at UC Davis. Uh, in her most important role is a mother. CEO enjoys learning from her 16-year-old son coaching middle school youth to do 5K runs. And um, she, she was one of my master's, she was my, one of my professors for my master's program at Dominican University where I got a, a master's degree and where she taught me law and ethics and human diversity. But most importantly, she taught me patience, respect, and how to work hard but to enjoy the process. She did this by example. For many years, she has been count, she has been count to lead for the healthiest fair in the nation. So, because uh, Marine County Fair is the healthiest fair in the nation, it's all because of CEO. So, um, it's, it's so much fun. It's so much fun working with her, and I'm so proud to know to know them both. And I chose CEO to be. Uh, she was my my um, my teacher to uh, my field work during my master's program, and I'm proud to call both of them my friends. Wow, Maria, that was a really, really nice introduction. The reality is I would do anything for Maria because she has done so much for me and for our communities. Um, she made me sound very fancy, but I locked myself out of the house yesterday and it was not so fancy climbing the fence and climbing through the doggy door. So, <laughs> so, so I'm grateful to be with everybody here who are uh, friends and partners in making Marin the healthiest place uh, to live, work, and play, particularly in our state. So I would love to be able to be here to talk a little bit more about my research and uh, developing a, a way to be able to reduce test-taking anxiety and also performance anxiety and anticipatory anxiety which should be fun and uplifting. But actually, I'm going to talk about um, some depressing facts that I hope you will see as, as opportunities to be able to change our relationship with understanding some of the things that people see here in Marin and experience differently in Marin. You'll see that I have to duck out at 1 o'clock because my 16-year-old is getting out of his AP exam at um, 1.30, so I'll duck out at 1 o'clock. We are so blessed that we get to live, work, and play in a beautiful county. We have more green and open spaces than pretty much anywhere. Um, and we also are the healthiest county in the state. We have wonderful opportunities that are available to us. We have more educated people in our county than most others. And we're in the top 17 as far as uh, income goes in the country. Our county, as far as demographics, tend to be a little bit older. We have 15% uh, more people over the age of 65 than any other county in the state. We tend to be a little bit whiter, as far as ethnicity goes, a little bit more financially secure. We have way more college degrees than most other counties in California. And most of us are employed and housed pretty dang well. <clears throat> we also have more access to um, healthy foods and places to play, so to be a little bit more physically active. And just a quick question to you. 
In 2000, Dr. Richard Jackson did some research and showed that 92% of kids played outside every day. How many kids played outside every day in, uh, I'm sorry, in 1950, 92% of kids played outside every day. How many kids played outside every day in 2000? 12, 60. Okay, 12, 60, 20. What if I say it's lower? Six percent of kids played outside every day. Wow. Well, that's a tragedy. It is a tragedy, and especially as we're thinking about here, we have access to play all these places, and still we are part of that, that those statistics as well. But we also know that we have really two marines. We have the what is available to people because they are more secure financially and otherwise, and they have more opportunities to be able to play in healthy open spaces. But then we certainly have other communities that don't necessarily have the same opportunities. So <clears throat> when we did some focus groups in um, five areas of the county, from the health department, we were asking communities what they thought their number one health problem was. So what do you think the Canal neighborhood said? What do you think their number, the number one health problem of the canal neighborhood was? Access. Access, that's good. Mental Obesity. health, that's good too. Urine Obesity place. is really good. <laughs> All of those things, the safety, that's another great one too. So what they said actually was immigration because of their immigration status, there was an increased sense of anxiety, stress, and lack of resources and all of these other things, fear including safety and all of these other things. What did Marin City say? Food. Drugs. Food, drugs, okay. Safety, Safety violence. Mm -hmm. They said the historic effects of racism, actually. Mm -hmm. So um, the choices that we make are shaped by the choices we have. Uh, in Marin City, there is no local grocery store. So even to buy fresh fruits and vegetables at the local pharmacy there, I walked in, I bought my apple, it was $2, it was bruised, and I ate the whole thing because it was a $2 apple, and it was like this big, and I was gonna eat the whole thing. <laughs> We've shared eating there together. <laughs> Hopefully your apple wasn't bruised when we served it. <laughs> Other areas, uh, Nevada. Their uh, social determinant of health in that neighborhood, and their number one health issue was determined to be sprawl. So lack of a sense of community that there wasn't one sense of a place where people all could come together. Um, West Marin, transportation was their number one health issue. So when we talk of two Marins, there's a two Marin in pretty much everywhere you're able to see. So we get to be the healthiest county in the country. We also, uh, for young people, according to uh, USA Today, but, and the healthiest county in California, but we also have the biggest income inequality, and guess what? We're also number one for binge drinking in every single age category, every single one. So minors, middle-aged adults, and older adults, we are number one. What do they define as binge drinking? Oh, that's a good question. They often have it here, but uh, is that the, the It's five for men and four for women. Yeah, I don't know, but our epi department could tell you that. They're the ones that came up with the slide. Um, and it's based on, uh, we have different data sets. For the adults, it comes from the California Health Information Survey, just data. And for kids, it's for the California Healthy Kids Study. Uh, and also the uh, state rankings that just recently came out. This is the fourth, uh, actually the fifth year in the row. This is our slide as of uh, just a few weeks ago. This is now the fifth year in the row that we are, we're among, we are ranked among the worst uh, counties in California for excessive alcohol intake. Especially kids. So this data is, uh, is based on uh, ninth and 11th grade data, one in six kids in the ninth grade and one in three kids in the 11th grade finish drinking. And then this one is um, just showing that income level, 
the thing that makes us the healthiest is also what contributes to our binge drinking problem. So lower income communities have a lower rate of alcohol use and binge drinking, and higher incomes have almost double the rate at higher income levels. Well, I can afford it. I mean, alcohol is kind of expensive. But we also know that your zip code can tell us about how long you're going to live more than pretty much anything else. So in Marin County, we should all move to Ross because they live to about 94 in Ross. And actually, what we drove through to get here is our lowest survival rate, life expectancy rate in the county. 77. There's a 17 year gap in life expectancy between lower income communities and our wealthy communities in Marin. We can, look at the, oh, sorry, we can look at that also in educational level. The lower educational level, and this is teeny tiny writing, but it says here some canal area, lowest educational level. Here are a couple in Novato and San Geronimo as we're going up Tam Valley and Kentfield. Ross is way up there with educational level and also life expectancy. And then Mill Valley had the highest education level. So um, the lower the education, the shorter life. So these are numbers of professional degrees. The lower income, shorter life. So here we are again with Canal neighborhood having less than 40,000 and then moving through uh, Novato, Green Bray, Smith Branch is right down there, San Geronimo Valley, Kentfield, Ross and Tam Valley at the, at the higher end. So this is actually not new news. This is well-researched, uh, the Wealth Health Gradient Sir uh, Marmot researched this in, in Great Britain many years ago. But at that time, they were saying, oh, the United States doesn't have social classes, so we don't, um, we don't have that same kind of wealth health gradient that they were experiencing there. Well, when we started to look, we absolutely do, and it's right here in Marin. It's also true when you look at, I heard a couple of you say that obesity was, enough, uh, was a problem for us. And it is. In the lower income groups, actually our kids are healthier weights than most kids across the state, but that's only really true for Asian and white kids. But Latino and African American kids have a far worse um, report of healthy weights as compared to the other ethnic groups. We also have one in three youth are obese in our county and one in two adults in the lower income community. So here you can see uh, obesity is much higher in the lower income adults. These are just adult slides. So one in five lower income adults um, are overweight or obese. And then one in 10 higher income adults. It's really a lot of but still over the 300% of poverty. When they did the uh, ranking of life expectancy and lo a low one was San Rafael and Smith Ranch area, yeah. do they take into account the people living in nursing homes and assisted living? Uh, yes, because it's census and vital statistics, but that's a really good point. Since there's, there's one right here. That, right here. Yeah. yeah. That is a really good point, yeah. But, the, but the, the reality is we still have that those same kinds of issues and problems in other areas where there are also um, older adult housing and other kinds of facilities too, and SNFs. And we see the same problem if we look across the country in uh, relationship to the World Health Gradients still. We're going to have a, um, a, 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 just a short uh, Q&A session afterwards, so. So this is the life expectancy by race and ethnicity. Um, in the United States, we do quite a bit better. California, and here's Marin County, that we get to live longer in Marin County than most of the rest of the state and the country. Um, but when you break it down by ethnicity, African Americans live much, much shorter lives in Marin County, 79 and a half years. Um, 
Then our white neighbors are about 83 and a half years. Our Latinos live five years longer at 88.2 80, uh, years. And our Asian Americans are live the longest at 90.9 years. So almost 91 years old and we're in. We had this really fascinating focus group one time of, of this discussion. We had Latinos and Asians and whites and um, just a whole mixture of all sorts of people. And at one point, somebody just said, can I just ask you, um, and it was one of our Asian American elders from the Vietnamese friendship group, what's your secret? How do you get to live so long? And it was a wonderful discussion to just be able to come together around culture and ethnicity and values and what was important to them. But what's important for us to look at here is really this gap between our white Maronites and Latinos. Because one of the research things that has kind of taken off is this discussion about the immigrant paradox. Now, we just talked about how the wealth health gradient is so powerful and important. Yet what we're discovering is Latinos are living longer and some of that is related to the Latino paradox or immigrant paradox, where people come from their countries healthy and then they get to the United States and start to become unhealthy once they uh, move into what poverty looks like in the United States. But actually, the protective factors of the immigrant paradox are things like coming and valuing extended family systems, welcoming babies into normal environments and culture and workplace, breastfeeding, um, having a sense of faith and spirituality. Um, it may actually be that the immigrant generation has more protective factors because they're the perseverant ones that are coming over and getting here, so there may just be something inherent in that that fast foods in their culture uh, are more about fruits and vegetables and things that are uh, God's fast foods rather than our fast foods here, which happen to be much higher in fat and, um, and calorie content and very little nutritional value. That transportation looks a little bit different in their countries as of origin too. There's more walking, um, using transportation, public transportation and bike and other kinds of more community focused things strong sense of community, and then this one about being uh, respectful of the environment. So I kind of, I always laugh because my dad, and, you know, my dad's a doctor, and yet he has this whole collection of mole jars, which is what he drinks his wine out of. It's like, <laughs> so the concepts of reducing, reusing, and recycle as, recycling as an indigenous value are some of these protective factors of the immigrant paradox. So moving away from the depressing into, God, isn't there something we can do about this? <laughs> we actually have been working closely with our communities across the Marin since um, 2013 to help us identify what are the issues that are happening in our most vulnerable communities and what can we do about them. So uh, we've partnered with community agencies, community leaders, and um, County Marin and other institutions to be able to engage communities in what's important to them, what they are seeing as their own issues, and what are their solutions to how to solve some of those issues. So gaining relationships, trust, and support, and building the capacity of the community to meet their own needs, um, and certainly doing a lot of support to make that happen. Um, so we never want to seem like this is the county coming in and telling a community what they need. We've been linking a lot of our primary prevention efforts and opportunities and thinking that if we can prevent some of the uh, health outcomes from happening by promoting policies and changing organizational practices and doing more upstream, then the likelihood of spending far more money downstream with um, much more costly interventions um, hopefully decreases. So we try to partner with events that are already happening in communities in order to be able to share some of this work and also to be able to link people to health care. And we also bring people together to be able to share ideas, opportunities, and really just to think a little bit better together. So we've used this not just for the Latino health work, but we see it as our opportunity to be able to bring people together in all of our vulnerable communities so nobody is left out. 
We also use the ladder of community participation that was uh, adapted from uh, or borrowed from Contra Costa County at that time. But this ladder just talks about how decisions are made in communities themselves. Is it that the government comes in and tells them what to do? Well, this is the way we kind of looked at this model in the beginning when we really didn't know what we were doing in 2004. And we said, okay, we're gonna have one health event and this is what we're gonna do and we're gonna get in and we're gonna get out. There was really no listening. This was just about, this is what the capacity was that we had at that time. And since then, we've much worked much more closely for the community to understand what's important to them. And now, in many of our communities, like the San Geronimo Valley is the model community for me and this work, they just tell us what they're going to do, and they tell us how we can support them. And it's wonderful. We also are able to do that in Marin City, too, where they just tell us this is what we need. We help support them and how that, that looks. But there are several areas in Marin that we have major challenges still in trying to even just find an organization or a group or an individual who's willing to hold this work. Novato is the one that we've had the biggest challenge with, with which makes some sense, right? So the same, same problem around sprawl is having a similar kind of issue in just finding a group or organization to be able to take some of this work forward. So we've used this work over the last 11, 12, 13 years to be able to create some discussions around policies. The Latino Health Policy Action Group has come together over the last year and some, and they identified five areas that they want to focus on. The big categories that they're working on are making parks and open spaces more welcoming to Latino communities. Now this is a really interesting strategy that parks and open spaces have because um, it's not just our county, but also the National Park Services understands that if we are not ahead of the changes in demographics, then we risk losing conservation, right? conservation of our protected lands. So this has been a National Park Service strategy to get people um, to know their own parks as a way to get ahead of assuring that parks and open spaces will be conserved moving forward. Decreasing the gap in the life expectancy, that 17 years is another uh, priority to this group and also to Health and Human Services. Increasing access to quality health care has been identified by those who have come together here. So there are the health officials, there are the hospitals are here, uh, policymakers are here, community leaders are here, and, um, and also community members. Focusing on Latino health economics, do any of you know Rob Eiler? He's, um, so he's an economist who has told us that it's really important to focus on Latino health economics as we are moving forward. And if we don't do that, then we risk having problems in some of these other areas as well. See, see if you explain what Latino health economics is like. Or second to last. And then uh, increasing the protective factors. So the last slide of mine is it is good that there are lots and lots of opportunities to be able to get involved. Here are just a few. You can join our Latino Health Policy Action work. We will have a meeting on the 21st, but the location is not uh, determined yet. By National Health Week, please, we will have 10 events in October. Ventanillas de Salud are open at uh, the consulates, particularly the Mexican consulate. David will talk a little bit about Viviendo Verde, maybe. And um, so bringing the green movement to the Latino community. And um, if I say, if I don't say, please think about strong start and early, uh, early starts for children. Um, my first five people would be upset. But come visit us at, or send people to the vision screening, which is going to be November eighth at the Marin Health and Wellness Campus, and it's open to everybody. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint for you today, but I, I wanted to engage in a conversation with you and, um, about indigenous about indigeneity in, uh, here in Marin County. Um, first, want to thank uh, the Marin Coalition for the invite and for you your participation here uh, today. Um, I wanted to sort of focus on sort of the, um, on indigenous uh, Latinos that um, that are populating. California, the United States. Um, a quick question for you, it's open. What are the four largest tribes in, um, in 
California. What do you think? Just off the cuff. Oh, 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 good. I'm glad you know they own casinos, though. That's great. That's great. So I heard now. I'm sorry? Agua caliente. Agua caliente. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Modoc. Modoc. Great, great answers, and I love the and I love and I love the fact that all these names are coming are coming forward. But the four largest tribes are the Cherokee, I was say Cherokee. the Navajo or Diné, the Choctaw, and the fourth largest tribe in California are Mexican Indigenous peoples in California. No, it would not. It would not necessarily. So there is a diversity of indigeneity that is within Central and South America and Mexico, right? Um, Guatemalans in the United States, there are over a million, 59, 755,000 Guatemalans in the United States, and 50% of those, that over 1 million population is Mayan. Another quick question. What the indigenous people that are living here in Marin County, San Francisco, Marin, from Yucatan alone is over 10,000. Okay. Marin County actually has one of the largest indigenous Mayan Yucatec populations in, in California, the next one being uh, Los Angeles. And guess what language they're learning to speak here in the canal? Spanish. Spanish, absolutely. <laughs> Right. Uh, Spanish is uh, the second language. And I think to what uh, CEO had indicated, um, there are these stress factors that are operating within the indigenous communities of assimilation or acculturation. But the acculturation and that stress is not just being in the United States or Americanized, but it's actually uh, acculturating to, Lat to Latino mainstream culture, and then American culture, right? So there's these, those, these tensions that are happening within the Latino community. Another issue that is, is uh, permeating the indigenous communities in here in California is also um, uh, the issue of discrimination. But discrimination within the Latino community Another uh, uh, quick set of numbers. Um, what is the discrimination? The discrimination of, about, so of, being, be a, of be, being indigenous. There'll be a Q&A session in a second. Um, Mexican, Mexican, specifically Mexican indigenous people. There are about 17 indigenous groups from the Oaxacan area that are here in California. We're looking at 165 to 250,000 indigenous people from Oaxaca. Um, and they, they, uh, they're not Maya. So um, uh, they, they may be from a Nahuatl uh, descendancy. But the Zapotec, Mixtec, Chatino, Chatino, and uh, Triqui indigenous people are the ones that are primarily the, all the beautiful salad that we're having here today, all handpicked by native people. Um, here in Marin County is about, uh, the population here in Marin County of Latinos is about over 38,000. And so if you start looking at, at uh, the indigenous numbers, that, that close to 40,000 Latinos are going to be indigenous people, okay, that are here in Marin County. And the one thing that, that when I do give um, uh, talks uh, is that the institutions here in California and throughout the Southwest and many other parts of the country, uh, including New York and Georgia, Virginia, huge populations of indigenous people also uh, picking uh, part of the agricultural industry. Um, are, are the, the, in, the industries themselves and, and uh, the institutions related to health um, and other governmental and educational institutions are not prepared to um, to really look at or even begin to be aware that uh, within the Latino community is so diverse. One, it's very diverse, and the multitude of indigenous people. Si yo puedo, si yo hablo español, hola, cómo está? Bien, y usted? 
Kich king ha hal dot bot de tech be ora kushane. Ben se mam be go olet de kushane. Champanayan. Champanayan. Kachikokama. Right? Very different, right? Very different. Um, so if you start looking at uh, in terms of discrimination, Absolutely. One of the some of the issues that are that are cropping up within the state of California, among within the Latino community, is this issue of um, not necessarily discrimination, but really not to be uh, ill prepared to um, to do interpretations and translation in indigenous languages. Um, the health disparities related to this are huge um, uh, within the criminal justice system. There's huge disparities within that in the interpretation and, and translation of all these different indigenous languages. So what we're seeing is uh, diversity within diversity. And indigenous culture is not a static culture. It keeps changing. So you may have um, individuals from Yucatan with green eyes and light brown hair who only speak Maya, right? So there is a diversity within a diversity. Um, cult, you know, culturally, they are Maya and uh, may not identify as Maya. Here's the other tricky thing. A lot of indigenous people don't want to identify as indigenous people, don't want to say, I'm an Indian, you know. It's not the uh, sort of romantic Hollywood notion of being native, right? You know, the, you know, on a horse across the prairie with a bunch of feathers and teepees and all that, right? So in Latin America, one of the, it, it's, a, it's a question of politics, right? And identity politics that's going on. Where you have um, a, a huge, um, again, discrimination within Latin America and South America for identifying or being indigenous, um, original people, and or then coming and then having Latinos who are immigrating or who were born here, uh, US, US born, you know, folks, uh, continuing patterns, right, of discrimination within their own families, and then uh, getting jobs within the infrastructure of, of, of government and um, schools, etc., and then carrying on these notions of indigeneity that are sometimes stereotypical, very static, um, and 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 again, um, some some type of bias that's going on. So, um, and it could be a matter of life and death. Um, uh, for example, in the healthcare, in, in healthcare, uh, it's very, very, I, just, I was talking to Kaiser the other day, he wanted me to come in and do a, a, a talk about this particular issue. Um, there was one particular woman who um, w had just given birth and um, she was um, um, at one of the local hospitals and she was saying, yeah, 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 right? And then folks that, you know, the nursing staff there said, well, she's saying now, 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 well, what does she want now, you know? And so they were trying to give her certain <laughs> medicines or things now, but what, what she was actually saying that ya in, in the language, in the indigenous language means pain, right? So what ended up happening was that she went into critical, into, into, into a crisis because she, she kept repeating the word ya and it was misinterpreted as being Spanish for yes. Right? Um, so many incidents like that are ongoing throughout um, the healthcare institutions in, in the United States. But that's a reality, and we can't, and so that's a reality. I think that Sia pointed out some major realities in terms of, of numbers, in terms of statistics, um, patterns, and this is another one. This is another one that we have to think about and be conscious about that um, not everybody, and one of the things that I, that I, that I told Kaiser, at least their staff, was that um, the healing, the healing, healing itself begins at the reception area. The reception, and this brings up a, a notion within our culture, in my people's culture, called inlakech. The word inlakech, right? I-N-L-A-K-E-C-H, for those of you that are taking notes. In La Ketch means you are my other me. And so it's not only a word, but it's also a philosophy. You are my other me, right? So we, we begin to uh, take on not only that word, 
learn that word and take it on as a personal philosophy, it changes the way that our personal encounters with everyday life with other people, I think. At least that's what the elders tell me. And so if you are my other me, right, which is, a, I think, a, a, one, a, a principle and a, foundation, a foundational principle uh, around the world, right, um, I think we're, we're, we're going to be headed in a better, a better way and be positioned better to not only receive um, individuals that are indigenous that are living here, and they're not going anywhere, um, um, and I think for ourselves, right, a better way to coexist with other communities here in Marin County, in the state of California. Um, in terms of um, um, uh, uh, I want to check in about spending here in Marin County for Latinos. Um, oh, let, let me let me let me go back a little bit. So one of the issues that's happening, um, why the huge influx of indigenous people, first of all, it, I think the Bracero program back in the 60s uh, by Governor Reagan actually oh, he opened the door for a lot of the indigenous people to, from Mexico to come to California, right? That was, a, that was actually state-sponsored US <laughs> federal program that brought in um, labor, right, to, to California, to the fields. Um, this is on the heels of the Filipino community and the Asian community. But um, uh, but the Bracero program was sort of the initiation of a, a long-standing pattern of indigenous people coming um, over over the border, um, and many for, for many folks there was no distinction right between uh, what was a Mexican and what was a Mexican indigenous person right. So um, but not until recently the the eighties I think um, and the reality of uh, the nineties reality of NAFTA. Um, sort of flooded Mexico with uh, uh, um, a lot of ag products, and the Mexican um, uh, farmer couldn't compete with that. So for many indigenous people in the rural areas, they had their kids and they had their wives working in the fields, and so the corn was put on the market and it was brought in from the United States, imported into Mexico at a lower cost. So then the, the cost of the, the indigenous farm laborer, um, I mean, the, he couldn't compete or she couldn't compete with, those, with, with the pricing. So it's like, well, why am I, you know, having my kids, you know, work the fields, not go to school, and then I can't even sell my corn at the market, right, at a, at a fair wage, right? So then they're like, well, I'm gonna go up north, exactly where all the, the labor-intensive ag um, necessity is, is taking place, right? So those are the realities of so, some of the um, issues taking place here in Marin County within the Latino community. And it has to do with um, uh, indigenous people, right? The, this, this tension between mainstream Latinos and indigenous Latinos, right? And, um, and then so, and I think I've, I've written a couple of articles on the in Marin Voice too, that you know, when there are um, encounters with Latinos, um, the assumption is, you know, oh, orale, Cinco de Mayo, and all that. And it's like, well, you know, no clue. Like, what? I'm Guatemalan. I have no clue what Cinco de Mayo is, right? <laughs> what are you talking about? Right? Um, so, uh, you know, so there's a lot of challenges within the, within the, within the Latino community right now. Um, but I think, uh, for me, my sort of um, forte is really looking at um, how indigenous people here in the state of California are actually helping maintain um, the quality of food, um, how indigenous people in the state are feeding the state, <laughs> the country, if not the nation, um, because that's a reality, right? And so my push is always to um, look at Latino culture or Hispanic culture and make sure that people are aware that there's huge diversity and it's very complex, and it's the it's not a one size fits all situation. Um, and I think we're living in a very we are living in a complex world. We're living in a more global world, global economy. Um, so we have to begin to think about these changes that are taking place in our midst, right? Um, so I think I'll end with that. And uh, but I really wanted to thank you and uh, for the time and, and the invite uh, for me here. 
I'm trying to shrink like a whole semester yeah. into 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Just for Latinos, these are just all. No, I know, but, the there, communities. but we were talking about that, so I'm just curious. So we worked closely as part of my National Health Week initiative work, and also the rest of our community health and prevention work with West Marin Services, and okay. we actually have regular um, health screening events at the Dance Palace, okay. and um, and also we have a connection with the um, the school, mm -hmm. and. Um, Lastly, the Marin Coalition was just, sorry, the West Marin Coalition was recently started last year to be able to decrease the high rate of binge drinking in West Marin as well. Okay. So thank you for alerting us to the diversity and, dis and disparities that we have here. Um, I'm interested in the mental health part, that was my field, and I know that mental illness goes across every possible <laughs> uh, ethnicity, um, and that community mental health is not very well funded, it never has been. And so recently there's been more talk about Laura's Law, and I, I'm a supporter, I'm just wondering what your thoughts about it are. I'm not really prepared to talk about that today, but I can tell, yeah. I know. Um, but I can tell you as a mental health practitioner as well that um, I've worked in this county since 1992 and finding resources in mental health for our lowest income folks has been extremely difficult and particularly if they don't speak English. So, um, and finding a Vietnamese speaking therapist, forget it. <laughs> we have one, I think, in the entire county, perhaps two. Um, so, being able to find things to be able to support mental health, I would, I would, jo I would go with you to wherever you want me to be to help advocate for that. Thank you. Try, try a Mayan. <laughs> yes, um, I was raised in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, which had uh, back in the '40s and the '50s, and uh, we were uh, a. a community that had Ukrainians, Poles, Hungarians, Czechs, Slovaks, Slovenes, um, Serbs, Croatians. I mean, we had languages from everywhere in Europe. I mean, very, very big problem. And the, prob the problem was solved by basically going straight to English. Now, I think it strikes me as a great tragedy for the indigenous people to get stuck in a halfway house when they're trying to get into this uh, culture. And that it's counterproductive to be, to be corralled into having Spanish as a second language as opposed to English as the second language. And um, I'd like you to comment on that. Yeah, it's a great question, I love it. But it, the reality is that if you go to Pickleweed and the public library, all of the ES, the lang English language classes for Spanish speakers are packed and on a one-year waiting list. Mm -hmm. So the idea that people don't want to learn English is false. What makes it more complex is that for an indigenous person um, who may be familiarized um, with some Spanish, they're going to learn Spanish in order to help navigate within the neighborhood. And at the same time, they're learning how to speak English at the same time. So they're actually learning two languages at the same time and acculturating t like twice, right? Because then there's like mainstream Latino culture, right? That exists. Um, and then there's, you know, US culture, right? That's, so they're, they're on a double whammy here. So, um, so, the notion that people don't want to learn English, it's false. It's false. P 
people, and I'm not saying directing that to you to, to specifically, like that you're, you're, what you're saying is wrong, but I'm saying that the notion itself, the generalized notion, is incorrect from our perspective because when we go to pick a week, it is jam packed. Here's the other thing there's individuals that, are, that do speak Spanish and that are illiterate. They don't know how to read or write in Spanish. So then there was at one point people that were um, volunteering to teach people how to read and write English in order to then get into the English speaking classes to better uh, you know, go through that with those courses. But that's a great question. Thank you. Oh, sorry, sorry. And then I also want to say that in um, countries of origin, there are programs now where folks, um, the Mexican government had different programs in Guatemala to um, uh, have uh, indigenous people learn how to speak, read and write Spanish. Mm -hmm. So that's happening mm -hmm. too. Hi, so uh, observation, uh, we learn and history is going on as we sit here right now. Um, they went in the CVS store in uh, Baltimore and uh, among a couple other items, uh, the Father's Day card rack was full, wasn't touched. Um, on, onward with our present day situation here with the Latino community, we've got some strong uh, family ties, religion. We, we never, it's, 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 a, it's a don't dare subject, but religion is something you could talk about because I love it makes the family <laughs> so much stronger. As a matter of fact, I, I, I want to apologize to Stephen Nessel for, because uh, I had asked him to, to turn the, uh, the, uh, the camera on because of being placed on YouTube and all that. But the audio is going to be available. So, um, and that's for spiritual reasons. But your question was, your, your comment was basically that Latinos have strong familial and religious ties, correct? Yeah, that's one of the protective factors, actually. That's one of the documented protective factors of the Latino immigrant paradox, too. Thank you. Uh, one of my uh, questions is, how do you help them stop interjecting, segregating themselves? Because I see that when the, when the, when the day workers, for instance, mm -hmm. when you go down there uh, and tell them, mm -hmm. they're all separated all the different nationalities within themselves. Mm -hmm. They're on each different location because they don't want to deal with each other. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And, and uh, 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 you know, creating those boundaries within ourselves is not an in la catch way of doing things. But, but that sort of self-segregation, um, unfortunately, um, is for indigenous people, I think it's a way of of being able to protect themselves from discrimination. So it's not necessarily that they're discriminated against others, it's we really sometimes need to be with somebody who speaks Spanish. So you have maybe 10, five or 10 indigenous people <coughs> gathering and look, per, the perception is that they're like not trying to integrate, but the reality is none of them speak Spanish or English, but one of them speaks Spanish. So they're having to rely on this one person to help them navigate what other people are saying to them. Earlier you mentioned uh, obesity, and I'm curious as to what the public knowledge is on the different diverse community members and obesity. Is obesity uh, relating to poverty primarily? Is it, does it relate to does it relate to uh, eventual disease? <laughs> how, does how does obesity really work in the community that you're speaking of? I mean, I, I'm looking at toxics in fast foods. So I'm talking about you can be wealthy and not eat fast foods and be obese. That's easy enough to be. Yeah. The problem that I'm looking at is are people of, of a poverty level that they, and, and the community level and the neighborhood level available to get all the best foods and have to eat at fast food places and therefore carry a large fat content. So you should do this presentation just by yourself because that's the whole point is exactly what you just brought up. It is a poverty issue, it is a neighborhood issue, it's an access issue, and all of those things that you just talked about, 
are, are some of our social determinants. If you look at the areas of concentration of where the fast food outlets are, they get run out of the wealthy areas around the community. There just aren't fast food places in our wealthy areas of the community. But you do see a bunch in the canal neighborhood. You see a couple around. Um, okay, you see more along the 101 corridor um, where the lower income communities live. Um, and here, let me, let me add to that. One of the other things that's happening is that uh, because of the high costs of, of, of rents inside the canal, for example, you'll have um, five or six individuals that are renting the living room, mm -hmm. right? And guess what? They have to pay extra to use the kitchen. So it's easier to buy fast foods at 99 cent for two tacos to get through the night than it is to actually get sometimes healthy food from the food bank and actually have somewhere to cook it. Well, and even just thinking about finding accessible, healthy foods too. You know, I was teaching one class on human diversity and somebody in my class said, well, why doesn't everybody just shop at Whole Foods? They know it's the best for them. <laughs> and uh, my, my poor dad, you know, he's, he is a doctor and he walks into Whole Foods because my mom made him go get a spaghetti squash and he walked out with one spaghetti squash at 11 bucks. And my dad just about keeled over right there. He's like, ah, oh. <laughs> I know it's good for you, but who, if, if you're low income, you're not going to be getting an $11 spaghetti squash. So what you bring up is really important as we continue to talk about um, the notion of food deserts too. And although for people with cars, we don't really have food deserts in Marin, but for people without transportation, we do. Here we go, thank you. Uh, Mr. Escobar, I'm happy that you said you like talking about religion. <laughs> this question has to, deal, has to deal with religion, and I wonder what the indigenous people of California are discussing about the Pope's rush to elevate Yonipur Serra to sainthood. Yeah, it's complicated, and I was I was um, both raised um, sort of Catholic with some indigenous undertones, um, and so it's complicated. I think there there's a whole slew of um, Catholic natives and other uh, natives that. Um, would support, you know, the canonization of Unipero Serra. Well, at the same time, there's going to be a whole slew of, of California Indian people that are going to say, no way, Jose, right? <laughs> no way. Um, and so just like uh, there is diversity within the native populations in terms of ethnicity and culture, there's also going to be a diversity within the political um, uh, spectrum. Right, um, and uh, so then the, the the other question is, you know, how do um, you know if you're if you're uh, indigenous and you're Catholic and um, and trying to keep your faith at the same time, you understand that a whole slew of injustices have taken place here in the state of California against indigenous people. You know, how do you begin to wrestle with that, right? And that's a personal question that each individual indigenous person, California native, is gonna ha have to ask themselves and deal with, with themselves. Now on a, on a more grander scale or larger scale, um, from a, a political activist perspective, you're gonna get a whole slew of different questions there. I'm, you know, myself, um, I don't necessarily agree with the canonization of Inipero Serra. Um, I think that that needs, I'm not saying that it's, it's a done deal, I'm saying that there has to be more time taking taken into account, and more of a, um, a historiography, a genealogy of what really did occur from the Pope, from the, from the, um, from the, um, from Rome, that needs to be looked at a little bit more in depth. Now, I know that they do that rigorously, um, but, you know, from whose perspective, right? And that's the other sort of question, and, and I'm not <coughs> saying either or, I'm saying that, and maybe this is the political way of me getting out of this, but, <laughs> but <laughs> right, but, but, uh, but it is complex, right? It is complex, it's, 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 it's complex. And so, um, but that's my position, you know, and, um, um, but 
I do think that there has to be more conversation about that. Okay. So there's okay, we got uh, one more question right here. Okay, last last question, and then we need to do the wrap up. Oh. Okay. Um, I'm I'm an educator, and I've been an educator in California and Dakota, and um, overseas. My question is, is twofold. Number one, how is the um, achievement gap has it gotten less within the last eight years or not? And this, my second question, which is on a personal level, I have found um, indigenous kids being uh, stamped as into the IEP mental uh, illness category because of the language difficulty. Mm -hmm. And uh, I asked them to please tell their parents, they're, you're a smart kid, please tell your parents to call the principal, you know, but it, it can't come from me there. I can start with the first half and then pass it for the and second. And but Sia has to leave, um, to but, go pick but up my David will school. stay. Um, and <laughs> okay, if you have more questions, you can ask them later. Thank you. Thank you. Can I uh, so the achievement gap response, uh, let me just tell you a very, very sad local story, and it's not even in the Latino community, but in Marin City, 100%. So all of the kids in the eighth grade class are failing. So there are only three that don't have Fs of the entire eighth grade class. They have Ds. All of them are getting passed on to high school. So our achievement gap is a major problem here in Marin, and that's, that's just the starkest example. But um, it's certainly true in our graduation rates across all of our African American and Latino kids as well. Their graduation rates are much lower. The good news is we at least do, um, we, we are getting more people around that can start have this, having this discussion that have a little bit more power and um, to be able to make some of those changes. But um, no, the achievement gap, which shows that kids um, pretty much read up to the same at the same pace up to the third grade, but then white kids skyrocket and they start to have much higher achievement and African American and Latino kids actually either stay low or never catch up. Why? Thank you. Well, some of the social determinants that we said of health are the same reasons, yeah, are the same reasons that they think contribute to the achievement gap. Just, just in terms of the, the indigenous part, that's again what I said earlier, you know, in, in, my, in my opening statements was that the governmental educational systems are not equipped or prepared yet to, to really be aware that indigenous people are here in the state of California uh, in huge numbers. I mean, you know, 250,000 just from one